Homo sapiens. That's a scientific name. And a scientific name is a combination of two Latin words that identifies every single species we know. If you ask anybody in the street to tell you three scientific names and the species they represent, 99.9 .9 of people wouldn't be able to do it. But if you ask for only one scientific name, maybe they would know. Let me try to prove it here. If I give you this scientific name, Homo sapiens, which species from the next slide do you think it belongs to? Tell me, from one to four, ready? Go, one, two, three or four. Can you tell? Homo sapiens is number four. Hey, did you think it was a lion? No worries, but now you know our species is Homo sapiens. You are Homo sapiens, I am Homo sapiens. Now, did you know that the four animals here are mammals? Because they are all mammals, they are all related. But one part of the body really takes humans apart. That part is our biggest acquisition. Could you identify it in the new slide? Heart, hand, brain, or mane? Please do not say mane. That super special human acquisition is the brain. But the four species have brain. Here, which one is ours? One, two, three, or four? Did you say the large one in picture two? That's the dolphins. Don't feel bad if you don't know. It's not easy. It is number one, but notice that in the previous slide, I show you the brain of the chimp, number four here, and you didn't notice. Not even you, Elier Fonseca, not even you. Brain number one is the brain of Homo sapiens. Okay, one easy question to balance the last one. Could you identify the food that Homo sapiens prefer? It is food in picture three, right? I told you this one was easy, but it was easy because while one, two, and four are raw foods, three is cooked. We love cooked food. And the introduction ends here. If you want a sneak peek into the rest of the video, this is the summary of the story I want to share with you. Once upon a time, some creatures invented cooking and the cooked food had such an impact on the brains of those creatures that it reshaped them into bigger and more capable brains that consequently transformed those creatures into modern humans. And now you can stay around to hear the whole story. Today is about why, and specifically about why cooking made us human. Now, this could be a good point to have our disclaimers out of the way. Number one, even when no one knows for sure, there is more and more evidence to support theoretical hypotheses that explain how we got our modern brain and consequently became Homo sapiens. Number two, please, find relevant links in the description below, which we always encourage you to check. And number three, we have no time to go in depth, but we hope to give you enough information and motivation to spark your interest about our origins. Here we go. If you search in Google images about human evolution, you could find images like this one. And here you could distinguish a few of the species that are considered the closest to us in the Homo sapiens lineage. Let me refer to four of them for simplicity. Australopithecus afarensis, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo sapiens. Remember, each scientific word consists of two Latin words, and the first one indicates the genus of a given species. The genus Homo can be translated as human, so there are three human species in the slide. Homo habilis, or handy people, Homo erectus, or upright people, and Homo sapiens, or wise people. Wise, wise, I am not so sure, but maybe because everything is relative. Sapiens is not such a bad name for our species. But only one is our species, the modern human, the wise people, or Homo sapiens. And it would be great to know how was it that Homo sapiens developed from now extinct primates? What made us human? 
Here are four of the several possibilities that one could find when identifying the factors that determine human evolution. Bipedalism, pool use, language, and cooking. Bipedalism is a form of locomotion on land where an animal moves by means of its two rear limbs or legs. All birds are bipedal, but among other large groups, bipedalism is rare. However, obligate terrestrial bipedalism is the defining trait required for classification in the human tribe of Minini. How could bipedalism help in making us human? Well, one clear advantage is in the regulation of energy expenditure. Bipedal locomotion expends less energy than quadrupedal locomotion. Did you notice I emphasized energy? That's the main currency for life, energy. And another advantage of bipedalism could be related to the use of tools, since bipedalism leaves the hands free. There are many possible advantages of using tools for early hominins trying to outcompete predators and prey. Stone hammers, clubs, spears, hand axes, and picks could have had hundreds of different uses. Sharp-edged stones, for example, would help them cut heights, meat, sticks, and other plant materials. Stones would also assist in pounding open hard-shelled fruits and nuts, bones for marrow, and skulls for brains. And that would translate in getting more and better sources of food to support life. Now, many animals are bipedal, and several are known to use tools to some extent but only humans are considered to have true language. But the origins and development of human culture, which includes articulate spoken language, are among the greatest unsolved puzzles in the study of human evolution. Nonetheless, the acquisition of language and symbolic communication and the refinement in tool technology very likely happened in conjunction with and were accelerated by brain enlargement. We are talking about human evolution within the scope of behavioral neuroscience because our brain is the most human distinctive acquisition. Take a look here. Brain volume in the y-axis was relatively stable for several million years. But once the genus Homo appears, brain volume skyrocketed. There are several factors that could trigger such brain enlargement on the way of transforming earlier hominins into modern humans. But the one I want to emphasize here is cooking. And I will try to suggest from this point on that we need to consider cooking when studying our origins. So let's start with this quote from Edmund Leach. Men do not have to cook their food. They do so for symbolic reasons, to show they are men and no beasts. This may not be true. Remember that energy is the number one currency for life. So we eat primarily to get energy. If we are given two different variations of the same food, one raw and one cooked, as an early human, we should go for the one with more calories available. But according to the USDA, the gold standard for information about food calories, raw food has approximately the same number of calories than cooked food. However, if you look around in the internet for people who would go into a raw food diet, the acclaim is always that they lose weight. You know what? I believe it. So raw food equals less energy. How is it that if you cook food, you get more energy? Take starch, for example, what makes about 60% of the world's food supply. Starch is such a complex carbohydrate molecule that in order to get the most energy out of it, we need to gelatinize the grains, open the granules, and expose the amylose to the digestive enzymes, making starch digestible to obtain glucose. This occurs during cooking. Similarly, cooking also increases significantly the digestion of proteins and helps with the softening of all kinds of food that in consequence increases its digestibility. Charles Darwin already recognized the power of cooking and I quote, man has discovered 
The Art of Making Fire, by which hard and stringy roots can be rendered digestible, and in poisonous roots or herbs innocuous. This discovery of fire, probably the greatest ever made by man, except in language, dates from before the dawn of history. Pay attention here, our closest extant relative, the chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans, get their energy from fibrous and hard food consisting of stalks, roots, leaves, seeds, and fruits. Consequently, they have to chew their food for long periods of time. But human food is soft and calorie rich. Because our bodies adapted to such high quality food, now humans have the smallest relative teeth of all primates, the smallest relative guts, the shortest chewing times, and the largest amount of available energy. And when you have the largest amount of available energy, you can feed a growing brain that can be about 2% of our body weight, but will account for 20% of the energy our bodies use. Yes, we burn a lot of calories by thinking. So here is another tip for losing weight. So about 1.9 million years ago, between Australopithecus and Homo erectus, the early hominins probably discovered cooked food and its benefits. Of the millions of lightning strikes that are recorded each year, many lead to fires in the vegetation, potentially allowing those first hominins to discover not only fire, but several different cooked foods in the burning bushes and forests. From that point on, everything could have been relatively smooth for our brain development. Higher calorie cooked food could have led to reduction in the god size, allowing even more energy to be used in feeding the brain. And because of a huge reduction in the time needed to chew and digest the food, now the early hominins had more time to create all kinds of tools and socialize. The brain would have had the right environment to keep growing and gaining in complexity from generation to generation, favoring social learning and language acquisition, and finally triggering the development of human culture and the origin of Homo sapiens. And we cannot be sure of this hypothetical scenario, but it could have happened. So next time you are sharing a meal with friends and family, remember that cooking made us human because it gave us the energy and the free time to feed our brains and develop our symbolically structured human culture. Another extra reason to be grateful for the food in our table and to remember how much we should thank whoever is the cook at home. Somehow they make us human. Hashtag I love my cook. And I finish with a quote that I find appropriate for celebrations such as Thanksgiving or Christmas. I quote, there is something profoundly satisfying about sharing a meal. Eating together, breaking bread together is one of the oldest and most fundamentally unifying of human experiences. You know, talking too much about food, I feel a little hungry now. But what to eat? Uh, any suggestions? Would you share with us down in the comments your absolute preferred food, the one you enjoy the most? Please do that. We love it when you leave us a comment. Here I finish. Dear friends, please stay safe and God bless you.